want to have an open discussion about public trust in the police because I was thinking about this and I've been thinking about it for a while and I was really intrigued and this is a long time ago when I looked into this about Finland's justice system and how they are so happy like they always are top of the charts one of the happiest countries on the planet and one of the major contributing factors to that that I found in research was that they trust their government. They trust their police. They trust their neighbors. There's a lot of public trust. So, I mean, think about that. Think about how much happier of a country the U.S. would be if everybody trusted each other more. Yep. Weird and you concept. were living less in fear. Strange concept. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it makes a really big difference in society when you have a society that trusts the authorities that are supposed to be taking care of them. You know, it's yeah. a, it makes a huge difference. Like we all have a subconscious. Okay. We all have all of these things that we don't even think about that are in the back of our head every day, guiding our decisions, guiding how we feel. Um, and I would like to ask you, do you trust the police? When you get in trouble, will you call them? Will you be nervous to call them? Will you still call them but be nervous? Um, how much confidence do you have? And if you have an issue, that they will get to the bottom of it and take care of you. How much faith do you have in investigators to solve a crime? I mean, it's an interesting question. So I found a survey taken by Pew Research Center um, it says it is a survey of U.S. adults conducted November 18th through the 29th of 2020, and it says that 26% of Americans trust police a great deal and 48 a fair amount. 48% of Americans trust them a fair amount. So what does that mean? That you're just willing to. Fair is not good. Yeah, I, I get that. But it does that. It, so their standard of fair, uh, it, it can change from a uh, from on a test by test basis. That's why I was curious. I didn't know if it went into what exactly fair meant is fair that uh, you're cautious around all officers, but you're willing to call 911 if you need help. Like what I was just curious what their definition of fair. Yeah, they didn't was. they didn't list that, but that's a really good question because I would like to know that too. And uh I I would really like to take my own poll of this, but it's you really want it to go out to a, as broad of an audience as you can, you know. Yeah, yeah. But um I found it interesting. And then I found on Forbes magazine, um, they list, uh, it says the post ABC poll, which surveyed over a thousand U S adults between January 27th and February 1st. And this was posted, um, 2020, February 3rd, 2023. Uh, it says that only 39% of people who were surveyed were confident police are tr properly trained to use excessive force. And one of the main things mm -hmm. listed in this. We're properly trained to use excessive force. Yeah. Like when mm -hmm. are they supposed to use? Got it. Like, Got you it. know yep. what I'm saying? Yep. I do now. Yep. This is the lowest level of confidence in police training the post-ABC poll has ever recorded, down 5% from 2021 and 15% from the first survey in 2014. Yeah. Uh, a 2022 Gallup poll found 45% of surveyed American adults are confident in the police, down 3% points from the previous low of 48%. I mean, I... In 2020. I feel like that is, um, I feel like they're being too lenient in that because I know when we were doing like the police corruption, uh, topics, there's been multiple times where I've looked up 
what the national standard of or what the national statistics for police corruption is. And I keep getting this survey that pops up that is a random survey of the public talking about what system is the most corrupt in the U.S. And over 50 percent of the people who took the survey said that it was the police. Wow. So if if 50% of an average you know random survey taken believe police are corrupt then there's no way those people trust the police. Yeah, but to say you trust them a fair amount like I will call them if I'm in trouble but I don't necessarily trust them. But I, yeah, 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 but I won't open my door for them or something. Yeah. 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 So I find it really interesting um, in how that affects our society and how we look at police and why do we feel this way? Why do we feel like we can't trust them? So the Pew Research Center also took a poll on, and this says, broad support among Americans for several policing, policing poli po po policies. Uh, this is the percentage who say they strongly somewhat favor each proposal about policing this country. Now this is like, here, I'll read the first one. Require police to be trained in nonviolent alternatives to deadly fo force. So this is like th policies we could put in place, um, things we could do to better the police in our eyes. You know okay, what I mean? Yeah. So require the police to be trained in nonviolent alternatives to deadly fo force. 71% said strongly agree that needs to be done uh, yeah yeah and then, i think those are big mistakes from the police that have severely hindered the general public's trust of them yes and then 22 percent said somewhat the next one's create a federal government database to track officers accused of misconduct 62 percent strongly agreed with that and 27 percent somewhat should be public is yeah what it should a be. federal government database to track officers accused of misconduct that's an incredible idea i haven't even thought of that before yeah that should be a thing like brady giglio like any reports of misconduct and tracking that and investigations into officer yeah i should i think that should be a public database i agree when it should. you have a doctor who is accused of malpractice that is public knowledge that is public record so why don't we have that for police officers yeah i agree i think it would be a really 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 good idea to have that i think it would be beneficial to the public uh i also think it would be beneficial to police because you know there's a lot of situations that we've seen out there where police officers have uh, done something wrong to where they were like forced to resign or retire or whatever, they move a state over and will get rehired yep. by a new department. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another uh, thing here um, that I actually saw. And this is the last one. I'll, so I'll skip over these two and we'll go back to them, but require officers to live in the cities or towns they police in. Only 35% strongly agreed with it and 39% somewhat. What do you think about that? Do you think officers should be required to work where they live? Um, that could make it hard for them to find a job, though. Maybe, but... Or afford where they're living. Or a county or something. I don't know. I... I think that that should be the expectation, but they should allow um, some one-off situations where for whatever reason, you know, they're having a shortage of people. So they're willing to hire up to 30 minutes away or something like that. Um, in the general area. Yeah. I, I think the issues in major cities, like if you have a police officer who lives in a really nice area policing a more poverty stricken area there can be like a social disconnect you're yep. not a part of the community yeah yeah and i can see that i can see that absolutely and it it gains public trust to have your officers a part of the community yeah the the only thing i mean it 
we see it creating a possibility of corruption in small towns, right? Because they know the people that are part of that justice system, part of the political game, or part of the major industries that are helping run that town. Um, and, and that has caused some corruption too. However, um, that's already happening. So I think depending on the city size, it could be a good thing to have cops that live in the communities that they police uh, for these bigger metro areas because in the small towns, they're already living there. Like, yeah, it, you know what I mean? They already know everybody and, and they're part of that police and community. That's so. a good point. On one flip of the coin in rural areas, it can be a cause for corruption. And on the flip of a coin in a metro area, them not living there could be a cause for corruption. Yeah. Like it, it, it flip flops depending on the size of the population of the area you're talking about. Yeah, it sure yeah. does. So give civilian oversight boards power to investigate and discipline officers accused of inappropriate use of force and other misconduct. 43% strongly agreed. 32% somewhat. Mm. Civilian oversight boards. It's not a bad idea. And that's what California's grand jury system is. Quarterly, they swap out the grand jury members and these grand jury members will uh, randomly uh, audit cases. And that's a wonderful idea. I agree. I think it's a great idea because look, it, it, it keeps the justice system and the police owned by the people. If there's not enough ownership by the people, then the justice system and the police get to make their own decisions and turn it into what they want. And that's not what it ever should be ever, ever. Yeah. So I, I could see it being super beneficial. I agree. I think, I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think that it could also help restore trust because you're allowing civilians power in that oversight direct power in that oversight yeah like they feel like they have some more control over yeah. what's going on here and and how my police and my community are operating and handling things yeah yeah it's a i think it's wonderful so make it a crime for police to use chokeholds or strangleholds that's kind of a political one i'll mention it i don't really want to dig into it too much but 49% strongly agreed 25% somewhat agreed i bet i bet a majority would agree if they understood how easy it is to kill someone at the neck yeah it's actually really easy it is um Really easy. If you have your forearm over just a little bit too much and you put too much pressure here, I mean, it, it's it's a lot easier than I think a lot of people understand. Yeah, because it's a lot easier to crush somebody's windpipe than you think. It is. And uh, the person that is doing the chokehold, uh, when they have heightened adrenaline and everything, the concept of time leaves them and they could end up holding the person yep. a lot longer than they... Uh, meant to and you know another thing that happens when you get choked out is uh, your body can tense and it can stay tense for a lot longer than your consciousness hmm. so you can be unconscious and still tense and twitching to the point where the person holding the chokehold might think you're still awake yeah you're if you're behind them you don't know you can't see their face wow I, I didn't think about that, but you're right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I, I don't think using strangle like chokeholds or whatever chokeholds, whatever. I, I don't remember the other term. I don't think it's like necessary. Yeah. They have many ways of restraining people and ways to train officers to restrain people. They have tasers. Why do you need to choke somebody? Yep. I don't see the point. Yeah, and it is just political right now, just with some of the situations that have happened. Yep. Uh, but however, even these political topics, uh, you got to be able to highlight them political, but then be able to still talk about them in the same regard. Because if they're a problem, then we still need to change these things. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Regardless of how political they are or not, it doesn't it, it doesn't change anything. So now this is the legal defense fund. 
uh, wait, no, it's NAACPLDF.org, and it is the LDF Legal Defense Fund. Um, they have a report here that's entitled The Truth About Trust and Police. It is highly political, but there is one little part I wanted to read because I think it's important to what we're talking about in true crime. And they're talking about a report done by the Heritage Foundation, and they said it was not true, what, what they were alleging in it. Um, here, I'll just read this excerpt. First, the report suggests that the real issue plaguing policing is bad public relations, going as far as to suggest that scrutiny, scrutiny of police undercuts law enforcement's ability to do their job. This is not only untrue, it's dangerous. Public scrutiny and oversight do not diminish trust in police, nor does pub public protest hurt the reputation of law enforcement unaddressed misconduct and constitutional violations again and again over decades does. To argue otherwise is to argue that an unfaithful spouse needs a better alibi not to stop cheating. Right. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I, I, I haven't found a ton of arguments um, where people are actually going out there and being like, we need to scrutinize the police other than us. Yeah. <laughs> because it's important. That is actually what builds public trust is scrutinizing them and them addressing the issues and taking care of them. Well, exactly. It's just like in a position at work. Accountability is a really good thing. It doesn't feel good. Uh, it, 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 nobody likes it. But it creates beneficial outcomes. It creates a more efficient and reliable uh, employee, regardless of what the job is. It creates trust between you and your peers and managers above you. The only outcomes of accountability are beneficial. That I can't think of any negatives, but nobody likes it in the same regard. So it's the same thing as the police. Like, look. The public owns your badge. The public owns that position. It is our right. It is our right to hold you accountable as a citizen of the U.S. Right, right. And a lot of times I feel like law enforcement is taking the public and treating us like a baby and putting baby in the corner. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, they're... They don't listen. They just do what they want anyway. Yeah. And they're like putting the public down for scrutinizing them or for sleuthing and looking into their investigations instead of being open, transparent, and addressing concerns. In the Brian Koberger case, okay, instead of addressing the public's concerns with the investigation in the case, you know what they did? You just got to trust us. The sleuths out there are just wild, just running with wild rumors. We put out all these facts and then they take on a life of their own and they run with the rumors and then you don't even know what's true anymore. Instead of addressing our concerns and making sure we understand this is what you can know and we can give to you and we need, we want to get the information out to you um, and we'll do it as we can and, you know, look at the great work we're doing and, you know, giving us some information so that the rumors can be put to rest. Instead, it's like there was literally a gag on the case from the beginning and they didn't want to give the public anything. And they put everyone down. Yeah, to the point where nobody is trusting anything. I mean, we just heard the other day where people are saying, oh, well, the PCA or the evidence that was used in the arrest of Brian Koberger uh, is not actually the PCA. It's actually fake. However, um, I... I don't see worth in that because regardless, the lead investigator is Brett Payne. That's not a maybe. That's not a question. So even if it's not the, the single document that was submitted to the judge, the evidence of the statement made by Brett Payne is the evidence that's used in the PCA. They're the same. And, they are the same. And... If it's a bait and switch situation, I'm assuming we'll end up finding that out eventually. And there should be scrutiny of that uh, because I it's don't problematic. I, it's very problematic because it's not typical for them to seal a PCA and not tell the public and just give them basically like 
do a bait and switch like that. Give them like something that's essentially false. Yeah. Yeah. There's issues. That's a major issue. I, I don't think there's ever been a case to do something like that. If you can find one, please let me know. And how did that turn out for them? <laughs> you know? Right. Because uh, I don't I don't know that that is very typical or has ever happened. Um, but that's, I just feel like when you have an investigation that's at this scale, when you have a case that's at this scale and you want police, if you want investigators, if you want the public to trust you, be as open as you can. When they have concerns, address them. And all of these ideas that I just listed that they suggested for rebuilding public trust, I think are wonderful and all, but I think those are obviously policies and like there has to be funding into things like that, like a civilian board oversight, like more training and using less excessive force, better training and investigation for rural police departments who don't have a dedicated homicide unit and have dealt with very few murders, if ever, you know, like. There should be better training, obviously, but that requires funding to go into those areas. Um, so while all that's great and everything, there are steps that police can take without those things to help gain public trust. Yeah. Yeah. Things they can make a choice. It's at their discretion to do. Yeah. Because when the public sees especially in the U S when we have something like the sixth amendment that says the public should have access to a trial. They should have access to this information. We have public records for a reason. This is the standard. You have to have a reason to seal something off from the public, not to keep it public. Yeah. Not just because you don't like what we say when it is public because look we we would bet there's always going to be trolls out there i mean there's literally it's not a maybe there are russian troll farms. it's america like, we can say whatever we want though yeah but there's russian troll farms okay it's not if you just do a tiny bit of googling you'll figure it out so there is always going to be people online saying absolutely horrible things but the people that are online aren't necessarily the citizens that are within your city or uh, or or state or uh, general community. You know what I mean? And that's what's important when it comes to police is that level of trust. You have Baltimore that we talked about last week where they literally couldn't find jury members because the trust was so broken between the general public and the police. That's such an issue. Like Baltimore's a major yeah. metropolitan city and they couldn't find jury members. Oh, that's, that's some wild stuff. What is going stuff. on there? That's some wild stuff. Yeah. But I think it would be interesting. Has Baltimore, do you know if Baltimore's made any effort to regain public trust? Well, yeah, they had the Department of Justice come in. That's what we talked about. And the Department of Justice did a, a legal decree, which is essentially the federal government saying, hey, we're going to hold you accountable if you don't make changes to your police department. Um, and I believe that stats have been getting better, but I, I would have to look into it further. Yeah, I'm just curious what specific front. changes and efforts they've made to regain the public's in, like uh, trust specifically. Yeah, I mean, the decree it gives a very detailed outline of what they had to do. It wasn't yeah. a choice, what they had to do. Yeah. So uh, that's step one, because you can't build trust in a corrupt system. Right. So you have to fix that corruption first and then work to build the trust. Right, so, right. Which it, it makes us wonder, uh, you know, what level is maybe Idaho in and what we're looking at in some of these cases that very clearly don't make sense when you take your subjectivity out of it, whether you are pro-police in a way where you believe that blind allegiance is the only way to back your police. Okay, fine, cool. If that's your thing, go for it. Um, but asking for accountability and objectivity and transparency in your police is not wrong. So when we're looking at these cases in Idaho and we're seeing major problems in these cases, it's not wrong to ask if there could be corruption. We own them.
Well, and also that's going back to this that I just read, like scrutiny isn't the problem. It's mis unaddressed misconduct and vi constitutional viol rights violations. Okay. Rights violations that go unaddressed that they don't um, fix or acknowledge. That's what starts to erode public trust. Yeah. And that's what's happened in the United States. That's why these poll numbers are lower than ever. And in Idaho, um, you know, I have an article here that says 2023 was one of the deadliest for pollution, police shootings in Idaho. And they look at the data. Mm, so, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Law enforcement officers in Idaho shot and killed 13 people in 2023, making it one of the most deadly ever in Idaho. Yep. Well, if it's like Baltimore, we're going to continue seeing this progression. And That's they track happen. They track it all the way back to the year 2000. And when you look at this graph, it yeah, it's kind of wild. And it's not that many compared to other states, obviously. But Idaho is made up of a lot of rural area. So it, it kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's, it is one of the highest. The only one that is uh, equal to it is 2017. And when you go back to 2000, they literally only had two a year. Yeah. Like two, three, one, one, four. And then you just slowly see it rising up and up and up, mm -hmm. which is interesting. It's an interesting article though. Um, and of course they, they get a bit political with it, but I, I'm not here to dive into that. They mentioned the S.A. Floyd shooting though. Really? Mm-hmm. That That's was one of them they included in the 2023 data. And you have Idaho as one of the, like, what'd you say? It's second on the list of missing people mm -hmm. in the whole country? Yep. Uh, well, second on the list for the lower 48, not including Alaska, because Alaska has separate problems that the lower 48 don't have to deal with, so... I just, I find it really interesting. And you know that the statistics on wrongful convictions are four to 6% of people incarcerated in U.S. prisons given to us by the Innocence Project. That's their numbers, four to 6%. Um, so that has to happen somehow. They talk about, there's many reasons, okay, that it happens but a lot of it is doctored evidence, coerced mm -hmm. confessions. Yeah. Yep. And DNA is one of these things listed on here. Yeah. But I just think it's, I think it's an interesting topic. Um, if with the public mostly distrusting police, is that a public issue or is that a police issue? Because right now I feel like it's being put on the public. Like it's the public's issue. Yeah. For people who defend the police. Like you have factions of people who trust the police and have like a blind allegiance who are like, no, that's your guys's issue. Yeah. The police are doing the best job they've ever done. And then you have like people like us. We're like, no, it's our, it's not, just distrust for police it's you don't trust anybody till you verify and we're allowed to scrutinize them and they should be scrutinized because they should be held accountable by the public because they are our servants yep our yep. our tax dollars pay them public trust is only eroding because i believe and what from what the stats are showing and what i've been reading is because of what we're seeing. Yeah. And there's also an argument for the media here too. Does the media play a role in it? Yeah. We all have our issues with the media. But do you have any other thoughts about it? No. I think it was good information. No thoughts at all? No. Okay. Well, I want to know what you guys think. Um, any thoughts, opinions, anything you want to add in the comments, please let me know if you have any more data on public trust or ideas about how police could 
regain the public's trust to make these numbers better. I think it's important. I think it's important uh, because of the overall mental health of the U.S., of our society. It's tr I didn't realize how important trust was in the government and your neighbors to have like a happy, better country. The rates for crime in Finland are so low. They don't have issues with mass shootings. They don't have issues with all of these things. And you start to wonder why. And that yeah. was one of the major things they talked about in some of the articles I read. And I think it's really interesting. So please let me know what you think. Yes.